Hello and welcome to GameSack. We're back looking at the best and the worst, and we're gonna kind of change it up, at least I am this time. And You know, it's not necessarily the best game in a series, but it can be anything, you know, the best character who wears shoes, you know, just <laughs> random stuff like that. <laughs> Completely random for sure. But also you gotta note that just because it's the worst doesn't mean it's a bad game. True, and with that said, let's start off. In my first segment here, we're gonna look at which is the best OutRun game ever made and also the worst. The original arcade was amazing to me at the time with its smooth hills, great music choices, and it was just unlike anything we had really seen at the time. The Master System port was good, but it was severely lacking in some areas like the hills, which were super jerky and stiff. Anyway, I digress. The best OutRun is OutRun 2006 Coast to Coast on the original Xbox. I really hate the fact that there's a year in the title, it seriously dates the game. But no matter, it's still by far the best game in the series. It's also on the PlayStation 2 and the PSP, but come on, those consoles are way weaker. But seriously, it's still a good game on those platforms. So why is this one the best? Well, because it combines OutRun 2 with its arcade updates called OutRun 2 SP. Each of these have their own set of tracks, 15 each. So that's 30 different tracks to race on here. Each of them based on different places in the US as the name Coast to Coast implies, like the Golden Gate Bridge, or the Great Pyramids, or even Easter Island. I think that's in Wisconsin. There's also extra modes where you try to accomplish different things in order to impress your girlfriends or impress the flag man. There are a ton of these and they aren't always easy but it definitely adds substance to the game. Power sliding is very important in this one. It really is the only way to take sharp turns without losing speed. You also have really nice arrangements of the original three OutRun music tracks. But they did not stop there. They added two more instrumental tracks which don't really have an OutRun vibe, but they're still pretty good. And then they even added two more tracks with some lady singing and they're really not very good, so we won't be listening to those today. Oh, and it goes without saying that the graphics are outstanding and still hold up extremely well today. They look great in 480p widescreen, but imagine how amazing it could look if it were backwards compatible with the Xbox One X. I would love to play this in 4K. OutRun Online Arcade for the Xbox 360 looks great updated for HD, but it lacks the original OutRun 2 tracks and it's pretty bare bones all around due to the size limitations of the digital games on the 360 at the time. Oh, and this one was also available for the PS3 in Europe. Digitally only, of course. But seriously, check out OutRun 2006 Coast to Coast if you can. It's amazing. I want to go far away. There are a few bad OutRun games, but the worst is definitely OutRun Europa for the Sega Master System. Oh god. The amazing minds at US Gold and Probe tried to show us how an OutRun game should be, but as always, they failed. Big time. So at the beginning of the game, you see a motorcycle just sitting there. And by god, you need to catch some thieves, so you steal the motorcycle. Now you're a thief too! Gotta be one to catch one, I guess. In this wonderful game, you have to press and hold up to accelerate and down to brake. That means the steering really sucks since you need to hold up at the same time. Why well, yes, that's right, it was programmed in Europe, how'd you know? The buttons are used to attack enemies and also use a boost if you have any. As you drive along, you'll have to worry about police cars who won't get out of the way and even motorcycle thugs. You can punch them road rash style, but it's really not very satisfying. Also, you'll have a hell of a time not colliding with every damn thing as you drive. But the items that you can pick up that you desperately need, you'll pretty much always miss. Fantastic! Once you complete the motorcycle stage, you steal a jet ski. And after that, you find a car with the keys in it and you just take it. Who's the bad guy in this game? Because I'm beginning to think it's me. The game is really tough due to the horrible controls and the awful collision. The graphics are super choppy and it can be hard to tell what's going on. The music is kind of decent, but that's about as nice as I can be to this one. And the only thing that this has in common with an OutRun game is that sometimes the road splits. Why did you let them use the OutRun name, Sega?
Mickey Mouse is one popular rodent, and for good reason because he's a cool character. And if you've seen our show and have been paying attention, then you know that we both adore Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse on the Genesis. And it's the best Mickey Mouse game out there hands down. It's got a lot of charm. Just look at that little mouse and tell me he's not adorable the way he moves his hips back and forth as he's waiting for you to command his destiny. Or how his little tail moves when he's ducking. If the game has one shortcoming, it's that it's, well, too short. I can beat the game in 40 minutes or less. I always want more, but overall I'm satisfied. But I've also got to mention the remake of the game that I'm playing here on the PS3. I honestly think that I like this game just as much as the original. The essence of the first game is completely here. They might look a bit different, but they somehow feel the same. Sega of Australia did an amazing job with this title. The levels are expanded and take more time to finish, and that's great. The level of detail in the game is also something to notice. I love how you see the bosses of each world early on in the first area just hanging around doing their thing. It makes everything feel complete. All of the background scenery is recognizable from the original game, and damn does it look good, but it also feels new at the same time. And even the music is good. The game is narrated by somebody's grandpa, but it's not annoying and actually adds to the experience. Our hero wasn't sure if he was upside down, downside up, or if it was both. This is exactly how you remake a great 2D game. And it's really too bad that Sega of Australia was shut down after completing this. I wish more companies would put this kind of effort into their remakes. To me, this game is on the same level as the original, and it makes me really, really sad. Why, you ask? Because there's no physical copy. Once my PS3 dies, I won't ever be able to enjoy this game if the PlayStation Store ever closes. Now on to the worst Mickey Mouse game. Oh, and I'm not going to talk about any of the edutainment titles that he stars in like Mickey's Safari and Letterland on the NES because that's just too easy. Yes, this game does suck unless you're a four-year-old kid learning your letters and then maybe it's fun. It's impossible to die in this title and you don't even have to fulfill any level requirements to reach the end. But man, it has some good quality voices though. P. I. G. Oh boy. <laughs> but the worst non-edutainment game starring Mickey Mouse is Fantasia on the Genesis. This turd was made by Infogrames and published by Sega of America. Mickey has to collect music notes that are scattered all about each level. Sounds easy and it should be easy, but it's not even close to being easy. Mickey controls really bad. He's very sluggish in his movements and as anyone knows, this translates into really tough platforming. Since platforming is the bulk of the game, you'll have a very tough time getting anywhere. So you're supposed to be collecting these musical notes, but the thing is I've only seen one of them. And you can't move on to the next level until you find enough notes. The levels loop, I guess, since I keep seeing the same backgrounds every time I get to the end of an area. Firstly, I'm in a dungeon, then I'm on lily pads crossing a lake, then I'm swimming underwater, and then I'm back in the dungeon again. It's all very confusing and just annoying. Once I do get to the end of a level, it shows that I've collected four music notes. How I don't know since I've actually only seen one, but it just throws you back into the same levels again to find the rest of them. The swimming level is almost unresponsive. Once you feel you've got control over Mickey's swimming, he starts to flounder and your button presses feel dead. Another crappy thing is that each level is loaded with foreground graphics. Some of them are so big you can't see your character or any of the enemies that just might be lurking behind them. I used to think this looked really cool back in the day, but now it's just an annoyance when they're this big. And don't get me started on the sound. The music sounds okay, but there's these strange sound effects that just don't fit the game. Like when you land on a lily pad, for example. What is that sound? Ugh. This game could have been so good if more care was put into it, but instead, it just sucks.
Oh, yeah, good segment. And I've got to admit mm-hmm. that when they were making the remake for Castle of Illusion, I was very, very afraid. Yeah, I mean, who wouldn't be? Yeah, but it turned out great. I, I was really impressed. Yeah, I was too. As I mentioned, it's right up there with the original game. So. Yeah, indeed. Mm-hmm. Was, uh, check it out if you can. Anyway, we've got more. Okay, some people may not know what differentiates a textured game from an untextured game. A game like Sega Rally here is made up of textured polygons. That means it has detail provided by texture mapping applied to said polygons. Virtua Racing, on the other hand, is untextured. You just see the flat colors without any surface detail. These can be shaded and whatnot as well. Anyway, the best untextured polygonal, polygonal whatever racing game is obviously Virtua Racing, but which version? The original arcade? This one is awesome and it really wowed people at the time, myself included, with its untextured polygonalness. You had three whole tracks to race on, there was almost too much variety. Anyway, it's good, but believe it or not, it's not the best. That award goes to the PlayStation 2 version which you can find on the Sega Classics collection. It has all of the arcade tracks plus three new ones to race on. There are even day and evening versions of each track with clear and cloudy weather. It also has an extra Grand Prix mode to give some actual purpose to the game. And here's the thing, it even runs at twice the frame rate of the original arcade. The music is arranged, and even though the tracks in Virtua Racing are short to begin with, they sound pretty good here and never get old. There's even analog control for you to enjoy, though that's kind of a given being that this is the PS2. Calm down, me. Anyway, it works well and you can change your view at any time, though two of the views are mapped to your shoulder buttons and the other two to the face buttons. Personally, I would have preferred all views be on the shoulder buttons, and there's no option to change this. There are only a few other downfalls to this game. First and foremost is that the visuals are limited to 480i, and it can't be forced into true 480p by other methods, otherwise you'll lose half the resolution. The colors are also fairly muted compared to the arcade. And lastly, it's easy to get into crash chains where it feels like you just can't stop crashing. Oh well. I think that untextured polygons have aged pretty well, and I hope that the Switch version is even better when it comes out. The worst untextured polygonal racing game by far has got to be Hard Driving specifically on the Atari Lynx. Not only is the screen small and the graphics extremely blocky, they move around with a single digit frame rate. I'm not even sure why it's so slow as there are only maybe like 20 pixels on screen total. It looks even worse blown up like this, so sorry about that. Not only that, but there certainly is nothing pleasant about the sound. But what kills this game more than any other issue is the horrendous control. It's extremely slow to respond, which results in a ton of oversteer. You then try to compensate by holding the other direction and end up oversteering that way as well. As a result, you'll spend a lot of time off the road. In fact, you'll probably spend more time off of the track than on it. If I weren't so familiar with the other versions of this game, I'd have no idea where the track even was to get back on. They try to compensate for the bad steering by having this little dot which represents the position that the steering wheel is in. But come on, this is a video game, you need to look at the road, not a little dot. Oh, and good luck getting through the loop. You'll likely drive off trying to compensate as you need to steer as you go through it. I'm trying again and again and I just can't make it. It is extremely frustrating. Ooh, ooh, ooh. wait, 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 I think I'm gonna make it. Ah! Oh, and I hit an incoming car on the way out. Yes, of course, this loop has two-way traffic. And of course, it sets me back before the loop. Ah, thank God, I finally made it through the loop. But I've got to admit that I was never able to finish either the stunt track or the speed track. There just wasn't enough time due to all of the crashes and off-road exploring I was doing. And yes, you'd think the Game Boy version of race driving would be worse. And it certainly looks worse, but at least it's playable and that's what counts. Sadly, the Lynx wins at having the worst untextured polygonal racing game.
If I had to choose my favorite series of games from the past couple of generations, I'm pretty sure it would be Sony and Naughty Dog's Uncharted series. Ever since the first game on the PS3, I've always anticipated playing the next one in the series. There's something special about the gameplay in these titles that just feels perfect to me. The best game in the series has got to be Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. This is when Naughty Dog really shined and showed the mastery they had over the PlayStation 3. Right from the first scene where Nathan is climbing out of a train car that's hanging over the side of a cliff, you could tell you were in for a treat. That really was an intense intro that gave me goosebumps. A lot of the controls were refined from the first title. Fighting and shooting enemies feels really good. You're rarely alone in this game and mostly have somebody by your side. Either Elena or Soli from the first game, or the new girl Chloe that sounds like she smokes a pack a day, but she's nice to look at. Well, for a bunch of polygons, that is. Oh. Okay, I see where this is going. The thing is, these people never get in your way and actually do help you out when necessary. I also like the storyline and there's lots of enjoyable dialogue between everyone. Oh, bingo. There it is. That's the one. Yeah, it's gotta be. The one in the middle of all the gunfire and explosions. Lucky us. The scenery is lush and still actually looks really good to this day. The thing that really impressed me at the time were some of the huge set pieces in the game. Like here where Chloe and Nathan are all of a sudden on the bad end of a helicopter. We're in an office building and the helicopter blows the building up and it starts to crumble and fall while you're figuring out what to do. Also a later level where you're on a train trying to rescue Chloe. The whole way you're fighting your way to the front of the train. The game world feels huge as I feel I never saw the same background going by twice. Not that I had much time to stare at the backgrounds, but damn they look good. Even the puzzles in the game were really interesting. This title felt really well put together from beginning to the end and I was engaged the whole time. Lots of games you have certain areas or levels where you just wish it would end so you could move on. Not this game though, I never felt that once. All the Uncharted games have been hugely enjoyable but part 2 is the pinnacle. And you can even get it as an HD remaster for the PS4 with the Uncharted collection. The first entry into the series is Uncharted Golden Abyss on the Vita. Don't get me wrong because I actually do like this game. I played through it and I beat it and for the most part I was satisfied. But there's a few things that this entry does that made it less enjoyable than its console counterparts. Firstly, the game is on a handheld which means a small screen. The level of detail is good but it's still a small screen and would benefit greatly if you played it on a large monitor. It will play on a hacked PlayStation TV though and that's how I'm playing it here. The game is loaded with touchscreen controls and motion sensing features. These features are fine in certain games and I enjoy them but in a game like this I don't want that. I don't like going from controlling Drake with the analog stick to using the touchscreen to get over a slippery spot on a log. Nor do I like using the touchscreen to make a charcoal rubbing or having to flip items around so you can see all sides of them. Or how about when you get into a fist fight? Dodging enemy punches requires you to swipe the screen. Same with the machete on bamboo trees. Luckily, you can turn off the motion controls in the menu, but not the touch screen inputs, which is a shame. This game was purposely built to use all the features the Vita has, and while Bend Studios did a great job and the motion controls work really well, I just don't want that stuff in this kind of a game. But being the worst game doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad game. It's just my least favorite. If you do fall, you want me to bury you in those shoes? <laughs> sure. <laughs> As long as you get to wear your sneakers to the funeral. No dying on me now. Not while I still need you. Thanks for your concern. No problemo. That's what friends are for, right? Yeah, definitely get the Uncharted uh, HD collection on the PS4 if you can. It looks fantastic and it runs at 60 frames per second. Fantastic, for sure. Um, I gotta say that hard driving I know you had a little sentimental stuff about it a long time well, ago. Well, I like the Genesis version. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, still to me, I just play that and I just cringe. Just <laughs> cringe. Sorry. That's all right, though. <laughs> anyway, we've got two more. Space Harrier is one of my favorite games of all time, mainly for nostalgic reasons. 
You gotta admit, if you saw this back in 1985, you would have thought it looked cool. And it still is cool. You play as a dude who's flying, shooting down enemies, and trying to free the land of dragons. Oh, and what a gorgeous land it is! There are perfectly flat, colorful checkerboard floors as far as the eye can see. Nature is truly wondrous. And of course, my favorite stage is number 14. Some people say that it's the hardest stage in the game, but it really isn't. However, it is the most fun stage in the game simply because it's so fast and you really need laser focus. And I'm always a little disappointed in myself if I happen to die in this level. Now as far as the ripoffs are concerned, I can't count games made by Sega like Galaxy Force because Space Harrier was also made by Sega. If it were already available, the best Space Harrier ripoff would absolutely be Strike Blazinger from HitSparks Games, coming soon to the PC, arcades, and later the home consoles. I've played this one before in person, it's truly awesome, it's very intense. It adds some cool features to expand upon the formula and I cannot wait to play the completed game. It even has a two player simultaneous mode, that's crazy. But since I can only count games that have been released at the time I'm making this, I'll have to choose Night Striker from Taito and Ving as the best Space Harrier ripoff, currently. This was an arcade game and it was ported to the Saturn, PlayStation, and Mega CD and it was never released outside of Japan. And I'm playing the Saturn version called Night Striker S. You don't play as a flying dude, but instead a flying car. Your job is to fly around destroying enemies at wicked speeds. The control is a touch twitchy until you get used to it, which fortunately doesn't take very long. You can use the mission stick for the Saturn version and that really helps a lot. In fact, if you use it, you'll be flying through obstacles without any issue in no time. Between each stage, you'll be able to choose the area which you go to next, just like OutRun. Actually, maybe Darius is a better example since it's a Taito game. There are 21 stages in all and you play through six at a time and you have six different endings. During the final stages, you can transform into things like a big robot or a motorcycle. There's even an extra mode which offers slightly different stages and higher difficulty, but there are only six stages here and you never choose the next one. Overall, it's a fun game and easy to pick up and play, and it has a somewhat decent soundtrack as well. The worst Space Harrier ripoff is Attack Animal Gakuen from Pony Canyon for the Famicom. In this one, you play as a Japanese schoolgirl who can fly for whatever reason and you shoot down all sorts of weird things. Things like kangaroos, or armadillos, jellyfish, and yes, even human skeletons with sunglasses. It looks a lot like Space Harrier, only more silly and of course, less good. There are several problems with this game. First, you can only fire two shots and then you have to wait until they're both off screen before you can fire more. This makes it hard to kill anything. Also, you have to be right on top of something to hit it and sometimes enemies will touch you and of course that means you die. Not all of them though, so have fun figuring out which ones are bad to get in front of. There are little statue thingies on the ground that you can collect which will speed up your movement and also let you shoot faster. Trust me, you want these. But of course, if you die, you lose them. The collision is pretty wonky in this one as well. Things that you feel are not even close to you can kill you. In fact, depth perception is really difficult in this game. Speaking of which, if you press the select button at any time, you enable the 3D mode which uses the Famicom LCD shutter goggles. This same feature works in other Famicom Space Harrier ripoffs like Cosmic Epsilon and even World Runner. I've got to admit, that's a better option than Space Harrier 3D on the Master System where you've got to play through the game in 3D, get a high score, and then enter the word 3 on the second controller just to get an option for the 2D mode. This game isn't all bad. I like how in one stage you're swimming underwater and you have a different outfit on, even though it controls just the same as the air levels. The music is also bright and happy. But otherwise, the game is pretty frustrating and I'd just rather play Space Harrier. How about the best and worst title in the Shovel Knight game so far? 
I say so far since I haven't had a chance to play King of Cards yet, which is being released this month. Choosing the best game was tough because Shovel of Hope and Spectre of Torment are both really, really, really good. Spectre of Torment has some really fun play mechanics with his scythe. Slashing enemies in certain items acts kind of like a double jump. But I'm gonna have to give the first game, Shovel of Hope, the title of being the best. Shovel Knight is a character you can like immediately. I never got bored of his conversations with people and especially other bosses which makes me laugh out loud sometimes. The shovel is a great weapon and is so stinking easy to wield. Plus you have lots of different sub weapons you can use that are really effective. I love this game because it incorporates my favorite parts of old NES titles. Just like Uncle Scrooge's pogo cane and ducktails you can bounce on the heads of your enemies. You can keep doing this for as long as you can control yourself. And just like Castlevania there's breakable walls everywhere. This leads to all sorts of stuff from jewels to music to a dude that sells new sub weapons. The gameplay is so refined and balanced you shouldn't have a single issue controlling Shovel Knight. And if the game couldn't get any better, the music just about doubles your enjoyment. It's such a quality soundtrack that should be on everyone's favorite music playing device. They give it away free when you buy the game. Shovel Knight and Spectre of Torment are easily instant classics and I'm hoping that King of Cards will follow. and the worst game in the series goes to Plague of Shadows. In this one, you control Plague Knight on his quest to get the ultimate potion. The game uses the same levels from the original Shovel Knight, but they're modified in places to take advantage of the way Plague Knight gets around. And getting this guy around isn't always an easy task. He has a weak double jump that isn't worth the effort most of the time. If you charge the weapon button for a few seconds and let go, he'll rocket into the air. This is what you'll be using most often. But you'll also take a lot of enemy shots while you're charging up. Plus, it's difficult to control, especially if you're around platforms. You can equip some things to help, like this float burst which lets you glide to the ground slowly. Plague Knight's weapon of choice is the bomb. And I don't mean it's the bomb, I mean it's the bomb. Definitely a cool weapon, but it's hard to wield at times. You can throw a bunch at a time and they do lots of damage. They can annihilate some bosses very quickly, while others that float in the air can become a real chore to fight. You can customize your bombs in many different ways once you buy the abilities from your friend Mona. For example, you can buy bombs that'll arc when you throw them. Why isn't this an option to choose right away? You can mix and match this stuff all you want. Finding the right combination is tough because enemies and situations are always different. So what this really leads to is you'll be going in and out of the options screen quite a bit configuring your setup, and ultimately it just slows down the gameplay. Hey, at least the music is great and the conversation between Plague Knight and everyone else is very enjoyable. I'm not hating on this game. It's still fun to play, it just takes more effort since you just can't go at it like the other titles. Alright, I, I bought the original Shovel Knight on the PlayStation 4. I, I liked it. I didn't even know all those other Shovel Knights even existed until pretty much today. Are, are those DLC? Oh yeah, they're definitely DLC. I mean, uh, once you buy Yay. the Treasure Trove, you can download those other games and play them, and they're awesome. So, so they count as their own game, even though they're DLC? Uh, they're all part of the Shovel Knight, but yeah, I mean, once you play through them, you're going to notice some similarities in stages and stuff, but the layouts are a bit different based on the you know what the knight's abilities are so okay then and what do you guys think let us know in the meantime thank you for watching game sack Dave, I was really disappointed in your choices for this episode. Why didn't you do things more creative, like what is the best NES game to have five screws in the back of the cartridge? But, or perhaps maybe what's the best Genesis game that has a grid pattern on the box? But, or maybe even what's the best Master System game that uses an actual logo instead of a generic font? Why, Dave? Why? Why are you giving me such grief over this, Joe? I mean, really, that's what you want to talk about? I mean, let's take a look at what you covered. OutRun? Space Harrier? Dude, you've covered those a million times already. Come on. Sheesh. 
just doesn't get me. 